as we now come to verse 22 through 42, you're going to see a continuation, now in a different setting. And I tell you again, context is key and critical because now, and I take you to God's word, now we're going to shift into another festival. And as we've seen, the festivals have been used by God and John to create a stage from which you and I are to understand what Jesus is saying and teaching. Here in God's word, verse 22, at that time the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Now here's the thing, I've told you as we've gone through this study, you need to read your Bibles better. You and I both, we need to read our Bibles better. Here's a perfect case in point. If you don't understand what's happening here as we shift now to the Feast of Dedication or what some would call the Festival of Lights or what you know as Hanukkah, if you don't understand what that means, you will miss the point and most likely fill it in with what you want it to say, which you'll see is part of the problem that we face in our culture. Let me give you the context of Hanukkah, of the Festival of Dedication because you'll see now how it links back to Jesus, contrasting him as the good shepherd versus the liars, the thieves, the robbers, the hirelings. The festival of, of, uh, of dedication here, Hanukkah, it wasn't an Old Testament festival. You won't find this in the Old Testament. It wasn't a part of the old historical aspect of Judaism. You see, in roughly 170 B.C., Specifically, 167 B.C., Jerusalem was taken over. There was a Greek Hellenist who took over and had decided he was going to stamp out Judaism. He was going to convert the whole world to Greek power, as one of my friends likes to say. And in that process, desecrated the temple. Literally desecrated the temple. My, took a statue of Zeus and put it in the Holy of Holies, sacrificed pigs in the temple, had put such an oppression on the Jewish people that they could no longer observe the Sabbath. They couldn't circumcise their boys. They couldn't embrace what it meant to be a God follower as they understood it through Old Testament truth. But in 164 BC, there was an uprising. There was an uprising where the temple was taken back and the oppression was pushed down. And the Jewish people from that time on said, let us take eight days and forevermore remember when the holies of holies was recaptured and reconsecrated and re-administered as God's place. And here's the thing, they weren't and don't just celebrate that they recaptured the temple. It was to forever remind them that their temple priests had sold them out. It is a festival of remembrance of what happens when syncretism or compromise takes over the church. That's specifically inherent to the purpose of the festival is to remember not to ever allow priests or spiritual leaders to oversee us that will sell out to the enemy. You see, the religious leaders didn't fight to the death. They found a way to compromise and say, well, let's work this out. We want to continue to take care of ourselves, hold the position while we ourselves are leading an abomination. This festival of dedication to which Jesus now stands upon to make another statement was there to say, through Jesus' words, I am what you celebrate. I am the holy of holies. And I am the good shepherd as opposed to those liars, thieves, robbers, hirelings. The ones that the Old Testament, and they knew this, told them prophetically would come. I want to encourage you this week to do a slow, deep study of Ezekiel 34. Go and see where God himself foretold that there would come a time where the under-shepherds would be nothing more than hirelings. Jesus is now coming and continuing the conversation saying, 
I am the good shepherd. And hear me as we celebrate the coming back to purity and truth and denouncing those spiritual leaders who sold out God for their own bellies, who sold out their call to worship and lead people to the one true God under the name and claim of self-preservation. The miracle mergers, if you will. Oh, you know, we're still working for God, and we found a way to make this work. Come on, just keep taking care of us, and we'll satisfy them, and we'll take care of you. Friends, my prayer is that you'll develop a disdain for false teachers and false prophets that represent and reflect a holy, righteous anger. I said to you last week that those who are not true shepherds, oh, very polished in their religion, but not making disciples who make disciples who make disciples, not glorifying God in his truth. They are spiritual murderers. You know, and I just remind you, Jesus said that they seek only to steal, kill, and destroy What do you call an intentional killer of people? It's a murderer. Jesus has made this clear. Please see this moving forward because now you get a context that says, oh, wow. This is more than just a confrontation. Oh, it's a confrontation. Don't get me wrong. But this is a confrontation of eternal epic proportion. And I ask you again, do you know this, Jesus? Do you know this posture? Do you know these priorities? My friend Moses reminded us this morning, one of the great definitions of sin is inappropriate priorities. Say, well, I didn't kill anybody. Friends, if you're not about glorifying God in all that you do, that's sin. Whatever is not coming from faith, whatever is not a part of bringing glory to God, it's not right. And hear me, sometimes you being at peace and rest, that brings glory to God. So what are you doing to bring glory to God? I'm basking in the glow of my Savior. I'm being refilled as I draw closer to him. He's pouring into me for the purpose of pouring out of me. So it doesn't mean that you have to be up on a soapbox or that you have to be doing. It's about being. All the time. Being. Friends, we have so much syncretism, the same problem that the Festival of Dedications or Hanukkah was dealing with. And I tell you, it's, it's one of my calls, one of my purposes in life. We are, uh, we are not far away from launching another website called thatain'tchurch.com that is designed specifically to speak into this problem. Because we're not talking about creating false religions overtly. We're talking about perverting the truth under the name and claim of self-preservation or this syncretistic, which is just a fancy word for blending or compromise, with the world. Every time you see a church that says, well, what's it going to take to get them fill in the blank? That's wrong. The question is, what do they need in terms of God's truth and love and how can we help them to become more like Christ? How can we share the truth and the love of Jesus? Not what do they want or what does it take to get. It's what do we need to give that is in consistent reflection of the truth and the love of God and his word. 